afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for sharing your Wednesday afternoon with us. I'm June Rawl. Today's webinar, Plot the Course, Understanding test, Text Features and Structures in Nonfiction Texts. It's part one of a part two series. Last week, Daphne Atkinson from GED Testing Service shared with us features of the GED score report and how to use it to drive instruction and to ensure better outcomes. And she spoke of these uh, text features and structures. So today we're gonna elaborate a lot more on that. Text features and structures are important components of reading comprehension. Plus, these areas are assessed on all levels of TAVE 11 and 12. Today's webinar is part of a series of webinars focusing on specific college and career readiness skills that are assessed on the TAVE 11 and 12 reading portion of the test. Bonnie will take us through the importance of text structure and um, in nonfiction text. Plus, you'll have research-based strategies to take back immediately into your classroom. In future webinars, we'll focus on fiction text, author's purpose, key ideas, and details. But before we get started, Let's just go over some housekeeping rules. Please note that your attending microphones are muted. You know the drill. You can interact with us today via the Q&A section on your screen. And please do that. We love to hear your comments and your questions. You can type them in anytime throughout the webinar. Remember that today's webinar is recorded and you can find it on the IPDA website along with the PowerPoint that's being shown today and the workbook there as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Bonnie, and we're gonna get started on this webinar. Thank you so much. Thanks, June. Yes, today we are going to be exploring a little bit how instruction and text structure helps our students to comprehend written text. And we know that comprehension can always be a problem. We're also going to talk about what strategies are most effective for understanding nonfiction or informational text as sometimes as it's called. But you know, before we get started, I want to point out a brand new feature of the IPDA webinars, and it's called Guiding Questions. As you participate in this webinar, or of course later, as you may review that information or share it with others, you may wish to use these guiding questions that are located in your workbook on page one. What the guiding questions are to do is, is there a new feature to guide you along as you read through or reflect on the information that's provided through these webinars. We also know here at IPDA that oftentimes not everyone can attend a live webinar. So whether you want to attend the recorded webinars and structure your thinking, or if you wish to use this webinar with as part of your PD, you can use these questions to assist you in presenting it to your staff or cohorts. We hope that you find guiding questions a great new feature of the webinars as we continue to develop these to fit the needs of the field. So don't forget to look at the guiding questions on page one of the workbook and more about that in a bit. You know, from the research, Kistner, I think, says it all when she says talking about text organization helps our students see the macro level or the overall structure of the text. And that gives them a framework to figure out how, how all of those small pieces of information fit together. An important thing for our students to truly know. But before we get started, let's do just a very quick review, because there are two major text types. We have fiction, oftentimes called literary or narrative, and we have nonfiction, sometimes called informational. And these types of text are often categorized into four different areas, narrative, technical, expository, and persuasive. In fact, today I may go a little bit back and forth. So just realize that there are those different ideas. 
but we all know that a text generally has multiple text types in it. We don't see a totally technical piece or a totally persuasive piece. We also know that our students aren't generally asked to compare and label text types or to identify and analyze the author's purpose. Oftentimes in the area of comprehension, we primarily ask our students to gain knowledge. So, nonfiction texts, which is what we're talking about today, they're often categorized as technical, expository, or persuasive, as you can see from this chart. But there's more to nonfiction text. There's text features. Sometimes we forget that our students don't understand how to find titles or subheadings or why illustrations or captions are important. Or, of course, all of the sidebars that often occur in our reading materials. We do know that if we're looking at nonfiction texts, there are a lot of different types of comprehension skills our students have to have. And these should look familiar because we teach them all the time. And yet when our students have to draw conclusions or make inferences, often that's a real difficult thing for them to do. Again, we have all those persuasive techniques and all I can think of is when I look at some of the advertisements in my daily life, boy, do I see a lot of those techniques going on. So, whether reading an article, a graphic, or a story or a comic strip, understanding how text is organized really is that lifelong skill that effective readers use to both enhance their comprehension and also enhance their skills at summarizing what they've read. So text features, text structure, they both go hand in hand with comprehension. But you know, we talk about all of these things, but why in the world when we teach explicitly text structure, do we really need to teach it? Well, the research is very, very clear, and it's been clear for years. The reason we need to teach text structure and text features is comprehension. Because if our students know the different structures, they know the purpose that they're reading. And think about the kinds of things you've read already today. I guarantee that you took a quick look and determined what was your purpose for reading it. Did I do a quick review of the newspaper this morning? Did I get a memo from my boss that I knew I had to read specifically for detail because there were lots of things I needed to do? Or was it just a skim of the list of my things to do? I guarantee that most of us, we use text structure every single day for every single item. We just don't think about it. Text structure also is good for com comprehension because it helps our students understand what's important in the text. There again, if I have a good knowledge of how text is organized, then as the reader, I can see clearly what's important or isn't important. But guess what? There's another good reason, and you should notice a theme by now. It's all about comprehension. Because if our students know text structure and understand all the components of it, it really helps them looking for important topics and ideas so that they can retell and summarize the text. I used to get so frustrated with myself not teaching well enough because I'd have students read, and at the end I'd say, okay, tell me what you read about. And they'd look at me and they'd say, well, and you'd almost have to say, well, go look at the text again. And then I'd get the first sentence or the last sentence or something like that. They really had not understood text structure well enough to find those big ideas so that they could summarize it without looking at the text. Okay. So that's kind of the base for what we're going to talk about today, how indeed text structure really helps our students understanding what they read, regardless of whether it's for our, our classroom, for their workplace, or in personal life. But there is more to it. And with the new tape in 11 and 12 that's come out, we all say, okay, are these things important for this new test? Do I really need to teach text structure? Well, 
guess what, guys? It is important. If I look at the different blueprints for the TABE 11 and 12, take a look at craft and structure. It should look real familiar. And it's not just about those high levels. Take a look. Level M of the tape, 42% of the content deals with craft and structure, 38% in level D, and 42% in level A. Even in the literacy and the E levels, it's still an important part. So we can't start too soon. And again, these areas should look real familiar. This is why we're doing some of these webinars webinars to focus more on some of these big domains or big ideas of the TABE 11 and 12 as well as our college career readiness standards. But it's more than percentage. It's also about when I look at the actual standards and these standards should look familiar because they are the college and career readiness standards that we all teach using our Florida curriculum framework. But when I look at levels L E and M on this page, we can see that some of the assessment targets or standards do cover what's the overall structure of something, what's the narrative or speaker's point of view, can a student analyze different accounts of the same topic, similarities and differences. And of course, we also have point of view, even basic text features at level E. But it's not about these first three levels, it's also about levels D and A. These are the levels very important at the higher levels of ABE and of course in our GD prep program. And you take a look at the verbs where students need to analyze, determine, identify, compare, higher order thinking skills, but there again, an awful lot about text features and structures in nonfiction and of course in fiction. We can't forget that there is still fiction even though the majority of articles, approximately 75% on TABE and GED are indeed nonfiction. You know, if that doesn't give you a good enough reason for teaching all about nonfiction, let's just take a quick look at a couple questions and these are off the TABE and you can see the first question here on the left hand side of your screen, which of these best describes the structure? That question is very specifically structure. Author's purpose for writing. Author's opinion. Which, which sentence expresses the author's attitude, point of view? Advance his or her point of view. All questions on the current brand new tape that really do deal with structure. Now, quite honestly, I'd rather we didn't teach to an assessment tool, but it's nice to know that when we teach these things, it will assist our students on the assessment tools that we have. So let's click it from assessment and let's go into the classroom. But before I go into the classroom, I'm just gonna stop for a moment and just basically um, give you a moment to say, is there anything that you have questions on on TABE 1112 or we're headed with nonfiction? And if you do have a question, if you please, we'll just click it into the Q&A as we go along because we'll be answering questions as we go through the webinar as well as at the end. So, I have to say, were there any surprises about so much of the TABE 11 and 12 dealing with craft and structure? Well, June, since I'm not seeing any comments, I think let's take a look at what do we do in the classroom? Because it really is something that we need to do in every single classroom at every single level. So research, when we look at it, what's difficult for our students, does it matter at what level they are, text type and author's purpose causes difficulty, text structures causes difficulty, 
and even text features. That shouldn't surprise any of us because if your students were like mine, I would say, okay, did you notice the bold print or did you notice the blue color? And they'd go, what bold print? Oftentimes our students just don't identify those things. Okay, a question for each of you. Why might it be important for students to understand an author's purpose? What do you think? Why is that important? And again, if you will just keyboard your ideas into the Q&A for us as we get going, why is it important? I'm sure all of you have an idea of why that should be important to teach in your classroom. Definitely, it does help them determine the main idea. And it's also a great way for students to understand the reason why that author wrote that text. Two great reasons for um, the importance of author's purpose. Anything else anyone can think of? Why is it important that you teach this? Definitely important to understand what the author is trying to convey, and it helps students analyze and draw conclusions. Definitely a higher order thinking skill. Another couple of great ideas. It helps to read with a purpose and to gather supporting points as they read, review, and it does indeed promote higher level thinking. It's important to think about that purpose and gathering supporting points or evidence. Sometimes we call it evidence, sometimes we call it details, but there again, an important part of assessment tools, but even more important um, as we read for the workplace or real world we need to be able to do that. Some great ideas here. When a student misidentifies the purpose, he or she may make erroneous assumptions about whether it's fact or opinion. Bringing out another area of fact opinion. And this looks like it just came out of a GED thing to compare and contrast and to pro and con. If our students don't understand those areas, then they're gonna have a difficult time not only writing the extended response, but also being able to analyze that when they read. And that I word. It's important to teach that so that our students are better at making inferences. Okay, next question for all of you. Those were great answers. What might be confusing? about identifying an author's purpose or text type. When you're teaching this, what do your students find confusing as you ask the questions and they try to provide an answer? As you think about teaching this, what do you find is oftentimes confusing to your students about identifying an author's purpose or text type? And again, if you'll just click in your great ideas into the Q&A or a couple of you've done the chat box, let's share with others. Well, I'm gonna open it up. What my students found confusing was they'd say there's no one purpose or there's no one text type, especially in the higher order or the more complex uh, reading samples. They'd say, well, here it looks like the author's trying to persuade, but here the author's providing information. And so what do I say? Which one is it? Or maybe it's a technological, a technical piece, but I can also say that it has an opinion there. So what's the author's purpose? A great one. 
Our students sometimes find different things to be similar, such as persuasive versus informative text are similar. And you're so correct. So when they're asked which is which, it's like, I have no clue. What should I say? Great, great idea. Anybody else? Well, think about it for a moment. And, and if you come up with, in with some, um, please share. But yes, a great idea here. In order to do that, our students have to find clue words. And that's a definitely a great strategy. So let's take a look at a couple more and thank you for sharing. So what's the difference in text features versus text structures? We know, but sometimes our students may not. Text features, of course, are those components or elements of text that assist us in navigating and those text structures or the organizational patterns. But as we say, said before, both of them really do go hand in hand. So we've got lots of text features out there. In fact, on page three of your workbook, you're going to have a listing of different ones. And some of them will look very familiar to our students and we'll start out with it. Some of them you may say, hmm, what is that? And maybe not all of the assessment tools have things like margin notes, et cetera, or sidebars, but our students need to know the importance of these. It is a very base level skill. So, how do we get started? You can do something as simple as introduce a new text feature each day and then chart that feature and its purpose. And then have students identify different examples in nonfiction text. Very, very easy to do and a great thing to start the school year with or one of your new groups with. But the other thing that's a lot of fun is you can have students go on scavenger hunts and lots of things. You can use articles, newspapers, books, or all kinds of different things so that they can identify all of these different um, text features as well as locate them in real world kinds of materials. And if you want a few to get you started, again, we'll show you in a bit, but we've included two of them in your workbook that you can take right back to the classroom. So, with text features, lots of ideas, but there's more. And the next one's a little more complex sometimes for us to do because it's more than just recognizing. So with text structures, it is important that our readers can recognize them, but they have to be able to also understand them. And so as we're looking at the research says, it says that it's the key to unlocking expository, another word for us, or nonfiction text. And research strongly supports that the better a reader understands text structures, the higher the comprehension. But as I said, there's more than just identifying them. As you look in your books or online, you may find that there are different text structures out there. These are the most common, but depending upon where you look, they may cause, call them something a little bit different. You know, descriptive or spatial, sequence, process, order, comparison, cause and effect, problem and solution. These are the big ones, but here again, depending upon what you use, there may be more, or maybe one less. It's all about the materials. Just remember that there's more than just identifying them. But today, we're going to use these five as we get started. So, how do we teach common text structures? Because it is a big thing to do. Well, if we just kind of go with a step-by-step process and we use more than one day, our students are going to do much better. Tompkins, who has done a lot of research, suggests that there's just a few steps for teaching expository or nonfiction text structure. Tompkins says that good teachers introduce the organizational pattern first, introducing what one looks like and giving students an organizer for each. And then showing those examples that correspond to each text structure, presenting and modeling the use of those graphic organizers for it, and explaining, and someone said previously, that text structures can be identified by certain clue words or signal words. So 
We all know the Venn diagram. We know we usually use that for compare and contrast, and we know there's signal words out there alike, different, similar, same. All of those types of words that if students see them, they immediately know that this is a compare and contrast piece of text. So, but it's just beyond identification. And so we also want students to be able to use different text structures to write paragraphs or to ask questions of the text, to identify and use the structure of longer, more complex text, and again, to use text structure to answer questions after reading. Wow, that's a lot of stuff to do. How do I put it together in the classroom? Well, that's a really good question because one of our folks today said that some of our students, oftentimes our ESC students, have a harder time with text embedded under photos, et cetera, and they'll skip over things. So there again, it really is about more than just identifying, but integrating them into items for both text features and text structure. But let's take just a quick look at if I'm going to implement teaching text structure in the classroom. How in the world do I do it in a step-by-step -step process so that I know I'm teaching it explicitly? Again, we're going to go back to Tompkins and we're going to look at what Tompkins says. First of all, regardless of what text structure, introduce the structure and share different paragraphs or texts that use that structure. So we want to get our students familiar with what it looks like. Maybe it's compare contrast, maybe it's problem solution, but I want to show them first what it looks like without getting into all of the more intricate parts of it. And by showing them, I want to do it first. We all know about gradual release model. And so, first of all, I want to model the steps for my students before I have them do things with me in groups or independently. So after I've introduced the different structures, then I want them to identify the text structure they've been given. I want them to be able to underline those signal words or clues. I want them to be able to create graphic organizers because here again, we know that students learn differently and some of them need that visual. And I want them to take the information that they've used in their graphic organizer and write a short summary. You'll notice I didn't say I want them to use the article. Again, I don't want a regurgitation, but I want a summary of those main ideas that they've identified through their graphic organizer. Now you may say, whoa, can I really do that in my classroom? And yes, you can. Here's an example. I may start my day saying sometimes an author will want to explain a problem and then show one or more solutions. Today we're going to look at a text that does that, looking at problems and looking at possible solutions. In fact, I may ask my students, have you ever had a problem and what were your solutions to get them understanding that compare, you know, problem and solution is something that they do in their daily life. And at that point, again, I'm going to tell them what type of a structure they're using. From here, I'm going to talk about signal words. And there's nothing better than talking about signal words as synonyms. And of course, for both of them, synonyms for a problem, synonyms for a solution. In fact, most of you probably have a chart of the different words for these items. But next, I'm going to give my students an article. And this one is about something called stink bugs. And so I want them to read and underline the signal and the cue words. Again, nothing that they have to do a close reading yet, but they are looking for words because from those words, then they're gonna be able to determine that, guess what? I have a problem and solution article. What's the next step? Identifying the problem. And you may have students highlight it or you may have them go ahead and underline it. Here my problem is those brown stink buds are damaging things. They're bothering people and they're harming crops. Living in Florida, I think we have lots of those different types of animals. 
So I've got my problem. What's my solution? Here again, I want my students to go ahead and underline or highlight the solutions. And you'll notice here we've got a couple different types of solutions. One tells me, here's the solution. The next tells me an answer to the problem. Next step, I want them to create a graphic organizer. And here I may have them just write a summary sentence if it's a lower uh, level achieving group or higher level. I don't always need a paragraph. But you'll notice here that I can take that graphic organizer and create a summary sentence that is not going to look like anything in the article. This will be an important skill, not only for text structures, but also when we get into main idea and details a little later on in a webinar. Then I want to take a look at some summary questions. And there's lots of ways to do this. And I may say how something is similar or different. I may my, ask my students what was the cause of something or how did something affect. These are the kinds of higher order thinking questions that as an instructor, we want to be able to use in our classroom. And then ensuring that we do an integrated approach to reading and writing, that we provide students initially with frames and give them topics that they can write about and that it's easy to write about. And then from there, again, not just summaries of their learning, but summaries of things that they know about. Lots and lots of ways of doing it. So this is an example of doing that lovely thing called problem and solution. But we know that there's more than just that as a text structure. So in your workbook, just to kind of get you started, you'll notice that you ha will have a graphic. And what this graphic will do for you is kind of set the basics for teaching each of these structures separately first, and then you'll be able to go back together. Each structure in this chart provides you with, of course, the name of the structure, a description of what that structure does, and some of the basic signal words. In fact, that list of signal words you might want to have students add to as they read more things. That gives you the first part. The second part gives you some sample graphic organizers. Here, one with cause and effect. Here, with different causes and one effect. Again, the types of graphic organizers that students may see or may be able to complete. The next things for you or for them to self-analyze, some summary questions for cause and effect. What happened? What was the effect? What were the results of outcomes? In what ways did the prior event cause or influence the main event? These are the types of questions that we often see on our assessment tools from the tape to the GED. These are the higher order thinking summary questions that students often have to answer. And here again, sometimes have to infer the answer. And then last but not least, some sample paragraph frames for you to, to integrate that students can use to again, get started. And here we have the cause of something. Gosh, we could even go back to those lovely stink bugs. The cause of this damage is not easy to define. Some people think the cause is this, some do that. Again, for your classroom. After you've taught each of those structures, then it will be time to put it together. Yes, it does take time. But if it improves comprehension drastically, it's well worth our effort to take these apart and teach them separately with our students. Once they're done, then the activities are endless. In fact, one great activity is to provide students a variety of paragraphs or text from your content area. Gosh, I'm teaching social studies for my GED prep program. Let me get a number of things. I'm teaching science. Let me get a number of things. Or I'm teaching RLA because there I've got both nonfiction and fiction. Start by having them sort one or two types and again add up until they've got all types of text structures. And then have them use those signal words. What words did they use to help determine? You may want to have them work together in groups initially, but then from there, the next step 
or the highest order step is to provide them to give or provide them with passages that have more than one text structure. Now, again, as I said, will this take time? Definitely will take time, but well worth improving comprehension. And it's one of those things I guarantee that each and every one of you use this skill, but you forgot maybe that you had a teacher who actually did these kinds of things in the classroom. And of course, it's all about practice. Practice, practice, practice. Beginning with groups of students, maybe providing them an article and having them determine the main text structure, having them create that graphic organizer, having them write a summary, and then again, making sure that as they read, they underline those signal words to reinforce what they're doing. And then last but not least, to have them write a paragraph on a topic that uses each of those text structures. Starting out with something simple like vacations or sports teams or favorite activity or activities. I mean, as we're in so many sports right now, think of what you could do to have them write a short paragraph comparing and contrasting sports teams or cause and effect or problem solution. Why in the world is this particular team having a problem with turnovers? And what would be some solutions for it? What I love about doing something like the writing is it gets our students to begin that process of a constructed response as well. So here again, everything integrated one upon the other. So what would I do in the classroom? Definitely start out with text features and then move to text structures, taking the time that it takes to teach those and not forgetting that the end results or the end activities must indeed integrate more than one text feature at a time. So having said that, before we go on, questions or comments about these types of strategies or strategies that you currently use in the classroom that you say, this has worked well for me. In fact, one thing uh, one of you has shared is that you have your students select nonfiction books and fiction books as a warm up to teach uh, text features. And that's a great idea to compare contrast how those two types of structures or those two types of text, I should say, really look different when we're looking at features. What else do some of you use to teach text structure or text features? Now I know June, we have lots of folks from the field here who I'm sure are doing this very thing in their classroom. Well, as you think about it, I'm going to head right on for a little bit. Because the one thing with information I do want to ensure that everybody buys into is the fact that identifying text structures is not the goal. We don't want students just being able to say, oh, that's a compare or contrast. Oh, that's a cause and effect. The goal is for them to internalize knowledge and text structures, use it to enhance their comprehension. It is a step that we go the next step. And um, there's lots of materials out there. In fact, one of our folks said they use a tape reader 
reading comprehension book that does contain nonfiction articles. And that, again, great resource for us to use as we know the goal is to do many things before they get to that bottom line of being able to look at an article and say, wow, this has all of these things in it. So we want to help all of our students use those text structures, not only for reading comprehension, but also writing organization. So as you're teaching, don't overlook the fact, if you're a reading instructor, don't overlook the fact you're going to integrate writing. If you're a writing instructor, make sure that you integrate that reading process as well. And the last thing, as you look at some of those higher order thinking questions, that you help your students make those predictions and connections between the structure, the author's purpose, and of course, the main idea. So, as always, we wanna share with you just a few places that you can go to find some of the ideas and some of the strategies that you can integrate into your classroom. In your workbook, you have a number of resources, and these resources will provide you with lots of things all free. Oftentimes, we have a difficult time finding sample uh, paragraphs or text to use. And so what I'll tell you is the pure text paragraphs provide you with a fairly easy readability group of paragraphs that you can use, and they are quite um, pure. So it's cause and effect versus etc. E-reading worksheets, the same way. I always love to include something from the field, and this Reading Mama is one of the practitioners in the field that just does a great job in giving you lots and lots of materials. And again, you want charts to post in your classroom. There's a great one um, from teaching um, made easy for text features. You probably noticed that the ad lit. I didn't mention yet, and I will just let you know, it's a great website right now. They are down as of today for work on their website, but go out to it. If you try to do it today, you won't get there. But when I did a quick email to them, they said they will be up soon. But again, a great uh, website to provide you with lots of ideas and lots of videos out there, which again, you do have in your workbook from nonfiction text features to five types of text structures, because many of our students are very visual and they need those things. Don't forget, of course, Florida IP Day. There's two full-blown lesson plans on information or nonfiction text. And so those things are there for your use. And of course, today's webinar guide. So let's just take a quick look at today's webinar guide so you have a clue of what you've got. The webinar guides, like in the past, provide lots and lots of resources that you can use to your heart's content. So if you see something you say, I really like that activity, but I want to change it a little bit, please go ahead to do it. Please go ahead to print things. We talked about the guiding questions. You'll notice that your guiding questions are there along with the slide numbers on page one. You also have a couple charts, types of nonfiction, and the list is not exhaustive, but it does give you some ideas of nonfiction and the author's purpose, as well as the traits. And then some different features of informational or non-text. And you'll notice there's print features and graphics, some organizational aids, such as the table of contents, et cetera, and of course, illustrations. Also here, you'll notice that you have a step-by-step of how to introduce those text features as well as some text feature questions. At our beginning level, we want students to identify those text features. At a higher level, I want to make sure they understand why. From that knowledge level to how do the text features on this page relate to each other? What inference can you make? Which text feature was most useful in helping you understand? Again, different questions for you to use in your classroom. Again, I told you that you'd have a couple sample nonfiction scavenger hunts that you can use at all levels. And you'll notice the first one is provided chart format. And then you have another scavenger hunt that is in the newspaper. 
structure. We talked about the step by step. And so if you say, gosh, I needed more info, here you have the info on how to teach tech structure step by step. And you also have different ideas. You know, the sky is the limit when we're teaching that. So this may get your creative juices flowing. You have the different websites, the URLs for the videos that we talked about today, and the URLs for the lesson plans from Florida Ipe. And last but not least, you have the chart. The chart that provides you with the different structures, the definition for your use, and the signal words, as well as sample graphic organizers, even some examples of topics that you could use, summary questions, and then sample paragraph frames. I hope that what you find with this chart is it provides everything you need to develop today's or tomorrow's lesson about a specific text structure. And you'll notice that these charts were adapted by some folks from the field. And so they do have the credit provided to them because there's so many great things out there. Okay, we have, um, before we leave you today, we have a couple ideas and I'm so thrilled always when we've got information and ideas from the field. One of you talked about that you use colored pencils to underline color code different and similar cause and effect, different detail types, et cetera. And that's a great idea. Many of our students do very well when we color code things and it's the way they think. And again, a great strategy. Another of you says when students have difficulty understanding, you verbalize movie examples. Documentaries usually use cause and effect. Horror movies um, often use problem solution. Wow, what a creative idea and one that you know I absolutely love because it really connects our students immediately to what we're teaching. Fantastic idea. Okay, I'm taking a quick look on whether we have any other questions or answers for the day. Uh, teach outlining skills is another comment from you. Um, that the text features of headings, etc. Again, that is really a great idea. So let me ask you, today we talked briefly about nonfiction text with a couple teaching strategies for the classroom. Um, in December, we're going to come back and do fiction or literary text, a whole different way of reading and lots more elements there. But before I leave you today, any other questions or comments that you have? The workbook will be posted um, to Florida IP Day, so you'll be able to go ahead and get that. And one other comment, great comment, I have uh, my students create their own text feature chart so they can make connections. That's a marvelous idea. Anytime our students can make their own, much better than with us providing them with a chart that we've created. In fact, sometimes our students can be very creative when doing that. Other questions or comments? If not, I'd like to thank you very much for being with me today. Um, I hope that as you download the PowerPoint and especially the workbook, that you find some things that will be useful for you and your students in the classroom. Yes, I do believe the teaching of nonfiction text structures is an extremely important thing to do to increase comprehension. And so as I was doing some research for today's webinar, I was so glad to see that that was supported, not only by by the researchers in the field, but also by those of you who have been here. So having said that, I'm going to turn it back to you, June, to finish off for our day. Bonnie, thank you so much. This is a lot of great information. I know I'm going to go back and watch this webinar a couple of times. 
But before we close out today, we just want to take a minute of your time. You're going to see these questions that are going to appear on your screen. So we'd like to hear from you. If you could just answer those very quickly, we would appreciate your feedback. As you're doing that, I just want to remind you that the next webinar will be held on November the 7th. And the title is The What, How, and When of Low Literacy Adult ESOL Instruction. So Phil Anderson is gonna lead us in a discussion on that on November 7th. So we're gonna close the poll out. Again, I wanna thank you very much for attending today's webinar and we'll see you again virtually on November 7th. Have a wonderful day.